in amazing moment in Christian history, kingdom history. Let me enlarge it. Let me enlarge that because I don't like Christianese. I don't like to, I don't want to just limit what God is doing to Christians because certainly Chris, Chris, God is doing many, many things among people all over the world. Dr. Brenda Skillman, I certainly want you in this next conversation that God is really just this morning just began to uh, encountering the Holy Spirit. How many of you encounter? You have encounters with Holy Spirit. <clears throat> How many of you have encounters with Holy Spirit? Like real encounters, encounters. And uh, so those of you that Holy Spirit is giving me your name. We're going to further, as, as he gives me the details, I'll reach out, but had a wonderful encounter. And uh, it's a download. It's a download. Holy Spirit is saying to us. And uh, I believe that some of us are hearing not just for ourselves, but for future generations. And I really believe that you can you 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 can really if you tap in now, if you really become aware of his presence, if you tap into Holy Spirit now. It's going to be some incredible downloads. You're going to receive some incredible downloads. So today I want to talk about money. I want to talk about money. I want to talk about money. So if you have an aversion to that conversation, it's okay. But I want to talk to you about your money. I want to talk about how the next four years, uh, your money is going to be impacted how you see your relationship with money. So tag some people, tag some people, tag some people. Living well in the midst of chaos is going to be supernatural. It's going to be supernatural. I was listening to, um, I check in every now and again on Champions for Christ um, with the Stricklands, Pastor Strickland, Pastor Edwin Strickland and uh, the Prophet Sean Strickland. And um, I, I, I believe in being fed. As you lead, you must be led. And so I believe in being fed from uh, voices that are trustworthy to the text, theologically trustworthy. And I want all of you to become theologically trustworthy. I want you to, I want that to happen for us. Those of you that are. Uh, on IG, Zoom, those of you that are on all of the Facebook platforms, please share those of you that are coming in on the replay um, there on YouTube. Make sure everyone goes to the YouTube channel and subscribes. Just put my name in and subscribe. I want you to become theologically trustworthy. Somebody write that in the chat. I will become theologically trustworthy. I want that to happen for all of us, that we are theologically trustworthy. If, if, you, if you lead, if you are a leader, if you are um, going to take on the role or responsibilities of sharing with people what thus saith the Lord, uh, Dr. Angela Marshall, my Sora, good morning, darling. God bless you, Elder Sherry. Um, uh, Dr. Deidre, uh, you will become theologically trustworthy. Put that in the chat. I will become theologically trustworthy. That my opinion will not matter. When I stand before God's people, my sweet sister, theologically trustworthy, the music that she writes is theologically trustworthy. 
<clears throat> that the songs that we sing are theologically trustworthy, that the businesses that we start and that we engage are theologically trustworthy, that no matter what happens, Dr. Wilson, we are theologically trustworthy. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh my God, Zebulon, I love that. Someone going into Safeway, Holy Spirit said, give the homeless person $10. I spoke and I said, I will once I come out of the store, walked over and didn't know it was a Caucasian female and gave her the money and asked, could I pray? And she said, yes. But bless me was her reply, I love you. Wow. Thank you, Bishop, for changing my perspective of everyone that needs Jesus, even when they don't look like me. I, I praise God, you are becoming theologically trustworthy. Whew, glory to God. Elder Nettie, I was praying for you the other day. Um, it might have been through the night last night. We must become theologically trustworthy. Trustworthy. My opinions, Prophet Hunt, Linda Hunt, will not matter. We have to become theologically trustworthy. Leaders, those of you in five-fold ministry, you must ensure that your people know that you are theologically trustworthy, that you can weed through um, the times, the seasons, you can weed through this. You can navigate your way around uh, what appears to be relevant, what appears to be popular, what appears to be what the masses may embrace. You must be theologically trustworthy. We must make sure that everything that is connected to us honors Holy Spirit. That is not egregious in any way to Holy Spirit. That is not offensive to Holy Spirit. Now watch this, watch this. You must be able to discern between your opinion and your theological reflection. Somebody write that down quick, 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 quick. Good morning, Sean, Rosetta, you and your precious family. Branda Rabakowski, Tata Damasi, Valerie Wilkins, Pastor John Davis, Chandra Erskine. Am I theologically trustworthy? <laughs> Dr. Shazana coming from you. That's that's big. <laughs> She's a professor and a dean of a program. And she says, I'm good. Lord have mercy. Whoa, that's pressure. <laughs> Whoa, am I theologically trustworthy? Can I discern between my opinion? And my theological reflection. And 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 watch this, watch this, watch this. They 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 do not necessarily, probably the majority of the time, agree. Agree. And it's okay. It is okay for you to see your opinion clearly and yet see your theological reflection clearly. This, this is my opinion. <laughs> Bishop, God bless you, Bishop Middleton. But this is my theological reflection. And I must be able to discern the difference between my opinion, which is highly impacted by my experience, and my theological reflection. So that although I may 
engage both. I must emerge from the consideration of both with a pure theological reflection. And, 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 the, and the problem that I see in Christendom, Dr. Skillman, is that we have strong opinions, but we have made them theological reflections. Oh, shy. <laughs> and that is where error comes in. Strong opinions. And you're entitled to that. Your experiences create the dynamic hermeneutics that is through your lived experiences. All of our hermeneutics, all of our hermeneutics, no matter how much school, no matter how, no matter how many uh, 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 rules we apply to the hermeneutical exegesis of text, no matter, it doesn't matter. Listen to me. All of us must come to grips with the fact that our hermeneutics are distinctly unique. Distinctly unique. And it's okay. But you must separate your opinions from your theological reflection and understand and grasp the fact that my opinion may be very different than my theological reflection. This is how I feel about it. And I'm and I'm and I and I have a strong understanding of it this is where i land but once i looked deeply into into the scriptures i must admit that my theological reflections don't support my strong opinion and it's okay what i must not do is mix What I must not do is make my opinion a theological reflection. Now, that, 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 that's how you become theologically trustworthy. I am a black female. I am a black female. I'm a black woman. I am a Baptist born, Baptist bred, Black female born in Detroit, Michigan. My experiences. <laughs> Hang on, Dean. My, my experiences. My, my, my experiences are uniquely different than a white evangelical male, white evangelical female. My experience, my hermeneutics, my lenses, my worldview is going to be very different. My experiences living on the east side of Detroit, born and raised east side, may even be very different than my counterpart female, my black female that grew up on the west side. I, I, I am going to have some strong opinions based on my lived experiences. How I handle money, how, how I handle relationships, how I handle life, how I handle church, how I ha what, what do I need church for? I go to church for different reasons, possibly than the white male, possibly than the... I go to church because I need God. I don't go to church because I am God. I go to church because I need God. 
because people think they are God. They go to church because they think they are God. They think that everything they say is what God wants them to say because of privilege, because of access. And that's okay. The danger is when we try to make our opinions a theological reflection. And we do that, we, we, we do that in and out of the pulpit. Look, I can argue with the best of you about politics. I can argue with the best of you. But I also am wise enough theologically that I know that some of my strong opinions are not theologically sound. Are you listening to me? And so you, the prophets of God, you got to be careful that you don't prophesy from your opinions or from your emotions or from your lived experiences. You don't prophesy. You have to be theologically trustworthy. If you are an evangelist gift, you have to be theological because you are such a people pleaser. You have to make sure that your reflections are theologically sound. As a shepherd, as a pastor, you are inundated with the, with the cares of the people. You're inundated with the cares of the people. Let me tell you something. Hey, this is a big thing. Let me just give you a, I am a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. A proud, proud, Pretty girl. Now, <laughs> I'm an AKA. I'm a girl. I cross. I am AKA. And some of you guys may have a strong opinion about people that belong to fraternities and sororities. But you don't have any theological reflection on it. And it's okay that you have. There's my sorrows up in here. Where's my sorrows? Anybody else in the divine nine? Come on, line up. You may have strong opinions about it. <laughs> I got some some zettles up in. I ain't mad at y'all. We love our daughters first. <laughs> don't matter. Don't matter what else happened after 1908. <laughs> It don't matter. <laughs> we love all our daughters. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. Come on here. Come on. Come on. 1913. Let's go. Let's go. They ain't here. And some of you have strong opinions about fraternities and sororities. Now, you don't have no facts. You just have strong opinions. But this is where you get in trouble when you try to make it a theological reflection. You're out of order. Yeah, it's no sense. It's, you're out of order. You're out of order. That's your opinion. And you are entitled to your opinion. But you cannot support it with any trustworthy theology. <laughs> let me help y'all. Let me let me let me just help you. Oh, I don't believe some of y'all. Oh, the, the, even the strong, even the strong will fall in the end. And some of y'all, I can't believe uh, Bishop Bond is in a, a fraternity. I can't a sorority. I can't believe uh, even the, those of you. And I, I've seen your posts. <laughs> I see. I see you engaging in that foolishness. I see you engaging in the foolishness. But you have, you have, you are entitled to your opinion. But you have to recognize that's what it is. My mama said it's, it's just like a door. <laughs> I can't, can't say everything my mama said. She said, but everybody got one. Everybody got an opinion. 
but you can't support it theologically. This 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 Bible won't support it. So when you when you are talking, just say I like Paul. I Paul believe it's wrong. That's fine. But you can't make it a theological reflection. You can't make that. So the error comes in when we try to make opinions our theological reflections and not understand that it is perfectly, Rhonda Dooley, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> you know, you know me and Cliff go way back. <laughs> But don't make it Bible. Don't make because what that does is that makes you theologically untrustworthy. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking bigger. I'm talking big. Y'all, are y'all with me? <laughs> whatever you call it, you can call it whatever you want to call it. Until you come on the inside. Well, some people say this, and they was on the inside. That's between them and God. That's still a personal encounter, a personal conviction. That's the, and they are entitled to that. But you can't make it a theological reflection. So stop trying. Just stop. It's okay. What we want to do is to be theologically trustworthy. <laughs> Dr. Christine James, we're doing too much. And this is why when we have these intense conversations about money, about tithes and offerings, about giving, about sowing, about reaping, when we have these strong, when we, when we get into, listen, 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 it's, it's, we have to be able to sit at the table and have strong discussions, strong conversations. And we have to be able to then draw the line and say, this is how I feel. This is really what I believe and it's okay. But I realize it's me. And so there were times in the text where Paul was saying, look, I speak this by permission, not by commandment. This is my opinion. It is my opinion that I, Paul, I don't allow in the Corinthian church, I don't allow a woman to teach. He was very, very clear. He was very, very clear when he was talking to Timothy that, listen, you got some guys that want to be leaders. So if a man desires the office of the bishop, here's some critiques for him. That wasn't by commandment. That was Paul's opinion, his leadership, his leadership system. And so we have to discern when one is the author that is speaking by their own lived experience that is speaking contextually and relevantly in that, in, in, in that space. And we, we have to make sure that we discern, is this a theological commandment? Or is this something that I personally believe? This is why we need Holy Spirit. As Dr. Katisha, I always tell her, oh, she's Jamaican, so she's strong and she has hard, strong opinions. And I always say, sweetheart, you don't have any experience in that to be so so strong in that space. Have you experienced that? No. I mean, you can't be that strong. You can't have such an opinion that that's the way it is and nothing else. You're entitled to your strong opinion, but here's what we do as Christians. We want to we want to rule over people. We want to say that's the way God made it. We want to make it. This is what God said. God said you shouldn't be. God ain't said none of that. That's your own opinion, and your own opinion is informed by your experiences, your your lived lives. I want us 
to be theologically trustworthy. I want you in this class to be theologically trustworthy. I will say it again. The reason that Holy Spirit has come to us to live inside of us. He woke me up with this scripture. He said, no, ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I said, wow. I said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He said, no, ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. He said it again to me. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. See, now that's the Lord speaking to me. That's that now. That's 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 not that's that's not something that that I personally would have said to myself. So this is not my opinion. I want all of us to make a commitment today to be theologically trustworthy. That means you have to study, you have to, you have to do strenuous work theologically. You, that's why I offer you books. Because I don't want you to ever think that Bishop Vaughn is teaching on the Holy Spirit and it's her opinion. That's why the Bereans were more noble than those at Thessalonica because they would search, they would research to see if the things that Paul taught were true. I want you, because in this hour where there's a lot of rhetoric, there's a lot of talking and people are saying, God said, God said this, God said this, God, you must understand that a lot of it is their personal opinion. A lot of these prophecies, and sometimes they come true, sometimes they don't, but it's not necessarily theologically sound. And we have to be mindful. Some of you, you know, I know y'all are young prophets and I'll come in your inbox and I said, mm -mm, take that down, take, take that down, take that down. John Royster, what did you say here? The topic of theologically definitely one that gets distorted by opinion. Well, I don't know. I don't know where to ride on that one yet, Royster. I don't know where you're on that. <laughs> we have to have that conversation, but it definitely gets distorted. It gets distorted theologically as well. I think. I think that that's uh, that that's that's a toughie. Because you can def you can definitely have a strong opinion about it, and uh, you can also be in a space where you perceive theologically that something may or may not be valuable, or may or may not be right, may be right or wrong. Um, that that's that's a tough one, and you're right. It is definitely one that. And, I, and I'll even add this to it. I also think it, that it is one that um, men need to have a serious conversation about because at the root of that uh, dynamic, at the root of that dilemma uh, is the male seed. I would love to have that conversation with a room full of men about abortion. I would love to have that conversation with a room full of men. Because I believe that at the root of that conversation on abortion, what we have not, what we have neglected to do is hold men responsible. I would love to have that conversation because I think the theological, the theological aspect would not be so much about abortion if the theological conversation was, was around the seed. <laughs> you need somebody come on in here. <laughs> Woo, I, I think I think we have missed that, and I, I'm I'm so glad that you raised that, John. I, I appreciate that because I I really believe that we are not dealing with the problem. The the, the theology around that 
is 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 much deeper and i don't think that we are having the right conversations john said his wife says that all the time absolutely because you can't you can't have that conversation about what happens on that end theologically when god holds the man responsible for his seed see that so so our opinion about that issue if it doesn't touch the theological responsibility of the male seed and what a man does how a man lives how a man chooses where to put his seed then you can't have that conversation and that that that, that is a huge theological discussion that we don't talk about we talk our opinions but we don't talk theologically about that oh russia come on somebody <laughs> Let's talk about some money for just a minute. Let's talk about money. Let's talk about tithes and offerings. How are you going to live this season? How, how are you going to live this season? How are you going to live this season? How are you and I going to flourish this season? How are you going to flourish this season? Thank you, Chaplain. Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, hmm, hmm. <laughs> Ooh, come on, Dr. Reggie. It's from a man to a man. <laughs> they don't want to hear that. You don't want to you focus on the womb, but you don't focus on the seed. That's 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 a powerful conversation. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! That's that's good. Woo! Again, we must be theologically trustworthy. We must be theologically trustworthy. Michelle Chisley says that's deep. Bishop, talk to men. Absolutely. See, that's the conversation. That's the conversation that we've not had around reproductive rights or choice or life. Yeah, we, we let the very person out of the room that God holds responsible. Who does God hold responsible for what happens in the womb? <laughs> Again, strong opinions. Without theological reflection. So, so the, how are you going to live? Come on, let, let's let me let me get to this supernatural living. Let let me get to this supernatural living. I want you to go to Second um, Corinthians. Second Corinthians is where we're going to go. Second Corinthians and. We're going to start in chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. Hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo, you bet. <laughs> you open not my eyes, but my mind. Absolutely, absolutely. Woo, Dewan, come on. <laughs> Woo, Rashiki Tababasi. I need receipt inquiry. Talk to me about what that question means, Ava. I've been paying tithes and offerings. First of all, let's change the language. You don't pay tithes and offerings, okay? It's not a payment. So let's change that. Let's change that. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ooh, this is so good. This is so good. Second Corinthians. <laughs> Y'all trying to get me down that other trail. We can go there, but not today. Let's talk about how to live supernaturally in the midst of chaos. How has Holy Spirit... So this is where theological reflection... This is how theological reflection is so, is so necessary. 
This is why we have to know the scriptures. We have to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Rightly divide the word of truth. Now, now watch this, watch this. Second Corinthians chapter number eight. And, and this is powerful because to me, it really does speak to uh, the Corinthian church, but it speaks to me, a very gifted church. Verse seven, Paul says, and this is my new King James, but I want to get this passion. Hold on just a minute. I want to get my passion Bible. Oh, I love it. So uh, second Corinthians, Chapter number seven, Second Corinthians, chapter number seven. And I want us to go uh, to verse seven. All right. The KJV says, the New King James said, But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, See that you abound in this grace also. Verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, I, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit right now to give you revelation on this. Holy Spirit, give me revelation on this text. Whenever I'm reading a text, whenever I'm going through, through this, um, I will, Marcella. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Please post a list of books. I shall. Okay. I'll put it on my page and the School of the Holy Spirit's page. I will do that. Um, Dr. Aqua, if you're around, you can help me with that. We are going to see a surge in America when it comes to money in these next four or five years. And that is, uh, it, it's just already happening. It's already happening. It's going to happen. It's going to continue to happen because in our particular um, country, United States of America, it is a capitalistic nation rather. And we have to realize, Ernest Alexander, that we are living among, um, we are living among those that um, have access to wealth like no other country. So we have to realize that. And we have to be okay with that. We have to be all right with that. Now, the temptation is that you will prosper through their system. That's the temptation. The temptation is that you will do well through their system. Now, I'm not telling you not to participate in their system. I'm not telling you that you should not participate in the vehicles of wealth. I'm not telling you that you should not participate in uh, annuities, in money market certificates, um, in investments, in having a decent uh, portfolio with multiple vehicles in it. I'm not saying that. So don't go out and say that that's what Bishop said. No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying that I need you to hear is that God's only sustainable plan of wealth is the tithes and offerings. That, God, that is God's only sustainable plan of wealth. That's what he sustains. So no matter who's in office, no matter who uh, is running the U.S., Department of Treasury, no matter no matter who is in the White House, uh, you and I, people of God, 
we have been given a plan that God sustains. And you can live supernaturally. You can live well. You can live supernaturally well in the midst of chaos. All right, I, I want I want you to hear this because here's what it says in the message. So you do well in many things. You trust God. You are articulate. You are insightful. You're passionate. You love us. Now, do your best in this too. That was Paul admonishing uh, the church at Corinth uh, that, again, you are a gifted people. You speak in tongues, you preach well, you do all of these wonderful things. But in the area of giving, <laughs> Bishop, good morning. In the area of your giving, write this down in the chat. This all got started with him fully, fully, fully with my babies at the Dream Center and at the cathedral. And really helping us to understand that this is where we have lacked. Listen to the numbers. Only 5% of people who identify as Christians, no, 5% of churchgoers tie. That's not just Christians. Only 5% of churchgoers actually tie. Wow. So now it breaks it down to Christians out of 247 million U.S. citizens that identify as Christians, 1.5 million people die. Okay, let's do the math. 247 million U.S. citizens that identify as Christians. These, these data, these statistics are available. If you Google, you can find it. You do some research. 1.5 million people tied. That's less. So, to, so if there were to be 10%, that, that would mean that, wow, that, that would be, 10% would be 24 million people tied. But the data shows that only 1.5 million living waters, thank you, actually tied. Now, watch this. Here's the data. If every Christian tied 10%, we're not even dealing with offerings, just the tithe. Our faith organizations would have an extra $139 billion each year. <laughs> Whoa, watch this. U.S. Christians collectively make $5.2 trillion annually. Nearly half the world's total Christian income. U.S. Christians collectively, no matter where you are on the income scale, make $5.2 trillion annually annually now watch this we talk about this guy musk elon musk and how he has billions of dollars but the collective christian family not dealing with anyone of any other faith expression but just christians our earning annually is five point two trillion dollars. So it's not that we don't make money. It's not that we're not earning money. So we're not 
not living supernaturally because money doesn't come in our hands. We are not living supernaturally because we're thieves. Because we're not supporting the work of God. We are not, we, we, we have an opinion that contradicts a theological truth. We have an opinion that contradicts a theological reality. I'm teaching better than you're shouting. My God, Oroboshi. Woo, Holy Spirit, give us revelation in the area of money. <laughs> we have made tithing an option, Kali. We have made tithing an option. That's our opinion. We have made tithing and offerings and giving to our local church and to the work of God. We've made it an option. But that's not a theological reality here again. <laughs> oh, it's not because we don't earn the money. It's not because money doesn't come in our hands. It's because we're thieves. That's what the Bible says. You're a thief. You robbed God. And not only have you robbed God, you have robbed the entire nation. Nation of believers. You have robbed the nation of believers because you have not supported God's work on a consistent level. So the nation of believers cannot impact the world and we are not seen as a viable financial commodity in our own country. And this is why when you go to the bank to try to try to borrow money, they don't want to borrow, they don't want to give it to you because our finances are up and down. Our finances are up and down. Someone said to me, uh, one of our one of our, our, our folks in our network uh, said to me, said, um, you know, we, we don't have a budget at our church and, you know, we don't do this. And I said, listen, you can't budget. You, you can't budget anything that is not sustainable. You, you can't budget. When people are not committed to tithes, what are you going to budget? Nobody can set a budget because the people who are there are not committed consistently to tithes and offerings so there's no way to gauge so what begins to happen is that you you do your best you try to you, you try to take care of what based on what comes in so you can't really budget because you don't know what's coming in you go on vacation and you don't leave your tithes and offerings you get mad at the leadership and you don't tithe you don't come to church you don't tithe you walk out with your tithes and offerings on a Sunday because you got a bill to pay. You keep your phone on, but you won't take care of the local church. You thieves. You enjoy the work of God. You enjoy the ministry of, of, of God. You enjoy the music. You enjoy the preaching. But you don't support. Listen to me very carefully. If we as believers were committed to the tithe and offering, to the wealth system that God sustains, I want to pronounce this over your life. You will live well. You will live supernaturally in the time of chaos. Not only will you flourish in times of abundance, but you will live well. You will live supernaturally in the times of chaos. But you're not committed. You're not committed. You're not committed to it. Oh, listen, listen. Let's let's see. Let's see what Paul says. Let's look at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 8. Chapter number 8. And I want to read this out of uh, my passion, my passion Bible. Ooh, yes, God. Hallelujah. And uh, it's very clear to me that we have not made a commitment to this. 
It says in verse 7, you do well and you excel in every respect. In unstoppable faith, in powerful preaching, in revelation knowledge, and in your passionate devotion. You, you, you excel in sharing the love we have shown to you. So, so make sure that you excel also in grace filled generosity. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Wow, 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 wow. Wow, wow. Say it out loud. I will live well. I will live supernaturally. I will live well. I will live supernaturally. I, I will live. Why? 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 Because I consistently I'm committed to God's plan of wealth. So it does not matter to me. My money is not contingent. <laughs> that, that was me. Watch this. It says, how do I, how was how to deal with a house that does not have a budget in place? You sold. You tithe. You give offerings. That is your responsibility. That is your responsibility. You are committed to the system of wealth. You have nothing to do with the weeds. I remember when I got elected as a, um, a school board member. And when you first get elected as a school board member, you go in thinking that you're going to impact the management of the district you go in thinking that you know as a school board member you're going to be down in the weeds and so the first thing they tell you is that you have nothing to do with the management of the district you hire a superintendent for that the board hires the superintendent the superintendent manages the district the board oversees the superintendent so you don't have much to do with the management you don't get in the weeds you write policies you oversee you you don't oversee the day-to-day -day activity and i think a lot of church members feel like okay if i tithe or if i give that i need to know where my money is going or i need to know if there's a budget or i no you don't get in the weeds you're not tithing or you're not giving because there's a budget or because no you are giving because that's god's plan of sustainable wealth for you and your family and your children and your children's children's children that's why you are committed to the tithe and offering. Thank God for the question. How many churches don't have budgets? They can't. How can you budget what you cannot sustain? Because people are not committed to the tithe. If people were committed to the tithe and the offering, and there was a consistency from quarter to quarter of what could come in, top budgets are based on projections. And so you can't project something when the folk have not projected the church in their weekly budget. See, the problem is not the church's budget. The problem is the believer's budget. The believer doesn't have the church in their budget. Oh, I'm teaching good. <laughs> Woo, how many of you want to live well? How many of you want to flourish? How many of you know you can? If you come to the place of excelling in grace-filled generosity. Let's keep reading. 
Paul says, I'm not saying this as though I were issuing an order, but to stir you up to a greater love by mentioning the enthusiasm of the Macedonians as a challenge to you. For you have experienced the extravagant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And although he was infinitely rich, he impoverished himself for our sake so that by his poverty, we become rich beyond measure. And that's, that's, this, this, is the, this, this is the Bible, folks. <laughs> this, this is the word of God. This, this is how we get to the place of supernatural wealth. This is how you get there because this is how God says, I will sustain this system. I will sustain this system. If you participate in this system, I will sustain. Now you say, well, you know, it's Old Testament. It, it is found in the Old Covenant. The covenant between God and Abraham, not the covenant of Moses. Now, when we talk about Abraham, and I've shared this with us before, that Abraham is our model. Abraham is our prototype. Not Moses. Abraham is our prototype. I love that, Barbara. Absolutely. I am committed and consistent. When I go on vacation, I make sure my tithes and offerings are ready. That money doesn't try. Absolutely. I absolutely. Listen. <laughs> that, that's, that's it. That's it. The believer's budget, you need a line item that says tithes and offerings. And that should be at the top 20% of your monthly budget as a believer. You say 20%? Yes. Your tithe is a minimum of 10. And your offering is a minimum of 10. Because your offering is the seed. And your tithe is the protection. The protection on the seed is the tithe. So well, I don't make but $100 a week. Then $20 is what you commit to. So I don't make but $1,000 a week. That's great. So $100 is the tithe. And I wouldn't give any less than $100 as my offer because that's what God multiplies. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Look here, John Royster put it in there for me. Proverbs 3, honor the Lord with your wealth. And the first fruits of all of your crops. And then your barns will be filled to overflowing. And your vats will brim with new wine. Wow. Wow. Honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. This, this is what Paul says. This is to prove that your love is real. Your love for God, your love for your local church, your love for the work of Christ, your love to the Holy Spirit and the gifts. This proves your love. You have to understand that whatever it is, if you are a business owner, that's your crop. If you receive certain security, social security, or you get uh, whatever it is, pension, or you take money out of your annuities, or you have royalties, or you have book, book rights and publishing rights, and you have music rights, you have, listen, listen to me. When you understand that the first fruit of all of your crops, whatever your streams are, belongs. You are so great. This is the proof of your love. 
You honor the Lord, Mama Prophet. Prophet Mother. Oh my God, Lynetta Harris. Good morning, Mother. You honor God. You honor God in your local church. Now, some of you say, well, I tithe. I tithe. Okay, so now let's look at your offerings. It's, it's the system. The system is twofold. It's the tithe which puts me in the house and the offering that is multiplied back to your house both in what seed for more sowing and bread for eating galatians chapter number three is where we want to go galatians three and my time is up already lord have mercy somebody say i must become say it out loud Theologically trustworthy. Now, when you become theologically trustworthy, then you'll become financially trustworthy. And many of us are not financially trustworthy. We are not financially trustworthy. Now, you can give offerings above and beyond 10%. You can give offerings. You give alms to the poor. You can be generous to people in the restaurant. You see that you just going to pay for their lunch, pay for their breakfast. You can be generous in giving to charitable donations, charitable organizations, rather. You can be, you can, particularly in this season of, of generosity and Christmas and as we come into Advent, you, you can be generous. Your offerings are never limited to your local church. Your tithes and offerings, you, you have to understand when you become, when you become committed to the system, you will begin to see a flow come in. You'll begin to see an overflow. You begin to see that you have more, you have more, you're not committed to God's system. And if you are not theologically trustworthy, you are not financially trustworthy. You're not financially trustworthy. And you have to say, God, I'm sorry. I, I am sorry. So, you know, people say, well, all of this is, is, is about the old covenant, the old testament. But I want to remind you that our wealth, even our faith, even the gift of Holy Spirit comes through Abraham. I want you to understand this, that God makes a promise to Abraham that God makes a promise to Abraham, not to Moses. Moses repeats the law, but it is Abram that God makes the covenant with. Oh my. Ooh, and, the, and the illustration in Galatians chapter number three. Is that the covenant between God and Abram, God and Abram, that the covenant between God and Abram, and of course, he changed his name, was fulfilled in the Messiah. Let's look at Galatians chapter number 3, 17 and 18. This means that the covenant between God and Abraham was fulfilled in the Messiah and cannot be altered that the written law was not even given to moses until 430 years after god signed his contract with abraham please mark this in your bible <laughs> Woo, Rashata. the law then does not supersede the promise since the royal proclamation was given before the law. 
If that were the case, it would have been nullified what God said to Abraham. We receive all of the promises because of the promised one, the Messiah, not because what? We keep the law. <laughs> Why then was the law given at all? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the seed, the child who was promised. And when God gave the law, he gave it first to the angels and they gave it to Moses, his mediator, who then gave it to the people. Verse 20, now a mediator does not represent just one party alone, but God fulfilled it all by himself. Verse 21, since that's true, should we consider the law to be contrary to the promise of new life? How absurd. Truly, if there was a law that we could keep, which would give us new life, then our salvation, listen to this, would have come by law giving. <laughs> or law keeping, rather. But the scriptures make it clear that the whole world was imprisoned by sin. So this was so the promise would be given through faith to people who believe in Jesus Christ. So verse 23, until the revelation of faith for salvation was released, the law was a jailer holding us as prisoners under lock and key until the faith which was destined to be revealed, would set us free. The law was our guardian until Christ came so that we would be what? Saved by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardianship of the law. You all have become true children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Faith immersed you into Christ. And now you are covered and clothed with his light. And we no longer see each other in our former state, Jew and non-Jew, rich or poor, male or female, because now we're all one through our union with Jesus Christ. Now, verse 29 is key, and I got to get out of here. And if you belong to Christ, then you are now Abraham's child, not Moses' child, but Abraham's child, a true heir of all of his blessings because of the promise that God made to Abraham. God's system of tithe and offering never came under the law. It came as a promise, a covenant between God and Abraham. Not only that, but his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God in which we embrace, in which we drink from, came through the covenant of Abraham. Now, if you excel in speaking in tongues, if you excel in prophecy, because of Abraham and the Messiah and the covenant. If you excel in casting out devils, if you excel in the gifts of healings and the gifts of miracles, you must also now excel in the grace of giving. It's all one covenant, folks. So when people say, oh, that's under the law. It, uh, no, it's not under. No, no, tithes and offering. My love is not, see, that's your opinion. But that's not theological trustworthy. The tithe, the offering never started with Moses. It started with Abram, whose name was later changed 
to Abraham. And the Bible says Abraham was exceedingly rich. Exceedingly rich. And if we are not teaching our people the covenant of Abraham, the covenant of well-being, God bless you, son. God bless you, Pastor David, one of God's great preachers. Oh, listen, if we're not teaching them and if we're not insisting on you by the spirit, you can't tell me you got the Holy Ghost and you, and you rob God. I don't care if you speak in tongues 40 days and 40 nights. If you are not a giver, if you're not tithing, if you're not giving offerings, no, no. The same spirit of God that comes through Abraham, the same gifts that come through Abraham, through our Christ, to us. Now, that system that God has sustained since Abraham, it'll work for you. It'll work for me. It'll work for you. It's, it'll work, folks. It will work. So I don't have to look at who's in the White House. I don't have to look at that. Those are streams. You can invest in those streams. But how can you invest in those streams and not invest in the covenant of God in Abraham? Listen to me. The law came 430 years after the covenant. So anybody say, oh, 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 uh, you, you over there tithing, you over there tithing, you know tithing is under the law. You stop them and say, no, 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 no. Tithing is not under the law. Tithing is under the covenant with Abraham. And I'm under the covenant of Abraham through Jesus Christ. I'm under that covenant. My church will not suffer because of me. My pastor needs something, I, I'm going to do it. There's a special something going on at our church, paying off the mortgage, or paying off whatever it is. I'm engaged. I'm a part of this because of the blessing of Abraham. Woo, Russia. Woo, Shekiba, you better hear me good. I'm not going to be left out. I don't care who's in the White House. I'm not going to be left out. I'm going to flourish in these next four years. I'm going to excel in my giving. Not only am I going to give 10%, folks, I've been giving 20%, 30% in tithes for years because I promised God that I will not rob him. And God has abundantly prospered. You all have got to get theologically trustworthy. Become theologically trustworthy. Separate your opinions from theological reflections. Don't care what nobody say. I'm tired. I'm tired and on the first fruit of everything I got. I'm going after the kingdom first. And all these other things, thank you, Pastor, will be added. I just got to get in God's sustainable system. It's the only system that God says I will sustain. Because I put my name on this one. I put my name on it with Abraham. I told him, I said, I'm going to bless your seed. I put my name on it. I put my name on it. I said, prove me. By the time Moses wrote that, oh my God. My God. It was way past the time of the covenant that was executed by Abraham. I got to go. I got to go, but I want to leave you with this. You will, you will flourish and you will prosper. These next four years, not only in money, but in ideas and creativity. I pronounce it over you now in the name of the Lord Jesus, that by his spirit, as you participate in the system that God sustains, not only will he return it with money, that's a small thing, but access influence, innovations, creativities, and ideas. The word of God. I got to get up out of here. <laughs> Woo, my God, get ready, get ready, get ready.